Hi, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Karen Murdoch. I'm a volunteer with the FEO Pair Alliance. I have been doing the welcome kits for the newly diagnosed uh, patients for about a year. And uh, so if you received one of these, I am the Karen uh, on the note. Uh, just a little history on myself. Um, I had a carotid body tumor removed in 1989 and then a vagal paraganglioma removed in 2003. I have the SDHD gene mutation. Um, my father, aunts, and twin sister have also had the tumors. I am uh, currently being monitored for additional tumors, and I'm actually having this testing done this week, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about it. Um, I am here with Dr. David Taib. We will um, provide a proper introduction in just a minute, but just a few housekeeping items first. This program is brought to you by the FeoPara Alliance, whose mission is to empower patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, their families and medical professionals through advocacy, education, and a global community of support, while helping to advance research that accelerates treatment and cures. Um, a special thanks to Progenix for making this webinar uh, series possible through an educational grant. A uh, quick look at our upcoming calendar. Our next uh, monthly support meeting will be May 2nd at 7.30 p.m. Eastern at 4.30 Pacific. Uh, Samantha Greenberg will be joining us at the end of the meeting uh, to talk about genetics, so that will, should be very interesting. Um, from May 5th through May 19th, we'll be holding our Never Give Up Fitness Challenge, a fundraiser for the FeoPara Alliance. Learn more and sign up at feopara.org. Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Engineer, uh, Imaging, sorry, uh, SNMMI will hold its annual patient education uh, day on Sunday, June 25th in Chicago. Um, and last but not least, the last week of August is our Awareness Week. We'll be posting more information soon, so keep an eye on, on social media. All right, a quick look at our agenda. Um, Dr. Taib will present for about 30 minutes and then we'll have Q&A from the community. We will ask questions submitted beforehand, and you can also type your questions into the chat session. We'll do our best to have all of the questions answered if time allows. Uh, many people will ask variations of the same question, so be, listen carefully um, as questions that are can be very similar. Um, questions that are less case specific are appreciated. Uh, now we have our disclaimer. <laughs> the information presented on this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not substitute the advice of your doctor and medical team because they have in-depth knowledge on your me medical history and current situation. Okay, and now to introduce our speaker. Uh, David Taib, MD, PhD, is full professor of nuclear medicine at Aix-Marseille University in France. He is a member of the EANM Oncology and Theranostics Committee, holds numerous research grants, is co-editor of two textbooks dedicated to nuclear endocrinology, and has over 240 peer-reviewed publications on PubMed. A major focus of Dr. Taib's clinical research, in collaboration with the National Institute of Health, has been to improve disease characterizations by molecular imaging of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. In addition, he is actively involved in therapeutic nuclear medicine with a focus on endocrine neoplasms. He is also affiliated to INSERM, the French Institute of Health and Medical Research, with several ongoing basic research projects on nanomedicine and nucleic acid therapeutics. More recently, he has coordinated the EANM practice guidelines and the SNMMI procedure standards in 2019, for radionuclide imaging of PPGL. He is currently co-chair of the upcoming Future Clinical Practice Guidelines for patients harboring germline mutations in the SDHD, one I have cool, and uh, SDHB genes. Uh, Dr. Taib joined uh, the Fiopera Alliance Medical Advisory Board in the spring of 2022. Dr. Taib, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very pleased uh, to be with you today, and I will try to, to share uh, some uh, information um, with you. So I will share my, my slides. Um, is it okay with you? Yeah? 
Okay, so uh, my talk is on uh, the use of somatostatin receptor PET CT imaging for uh, FEO and pheochromocytoma and pragangliomas. And we will try to discuss two different uh, questions. Why uh, should we use uh, this imaging modality and when? Um, so I'm working in France, in Marseille, uh, located in the south uh, of Marseille. This is the old port. Um, we will start with a few uh, background information, and um, and after we will try to respond to the, the two questions: why and when uh, should metastatic receptor PET imaging performed. So regarding a pheochromocytoma and pragangioma, as you know, it is caused by inherited genetic mutation more than other neuroendocrine tumors. We can estimate that approximately 40% of patients with PPGL have a germline mutation in one of the predisposing genes. And this is mostly observed in patients with extra adrenal uh, pragangioma, and also in patients with multiple uh, lesions, regardless of the location. As you know, PPGL can secrete catecholamine, but this is not uh, the rule for all PPGL. For example, most of the head and neck pragangioma do not secrete uh, catecholamine, especially metanephrine. Sometimes we can, in a large amount of cases, detect metoxytyramine, but you cannot find uh, elevated metanephrines. And the location uh, of the PPGL can be variable and widely distributed. And um, there are some link between tumor location and multifocality risk uh, and the underlying genotype. For example, as previously said, uh, for example, patient with SDHD mutation are more likely to have multiple head and neck paraglioma, and there are very few um, percentage of patients with abdominal, but it's not impossible, but it is not very frequent. Uh, PPGL can be also malignant, and uh, this is defined by the presence of metastas metastasis that could occur in lymph nodes cervical lymph node, for example, for head and neck pragangioma, but it could be also, um, that could be also located in the lungs, liver or bones. And malignancy mainly occur for large PPGL and, uh, and associated with some genotype. For example, the risk of malignancy increase uh, in patients with SDHB mutations. Um, an important point is that all management decisions of patients with PPGL should be carried out in an expert interdisciplinary team conference to optimize care. This is very important because uh, many physicians do not have experience uh, for management of patients with PPGL. And uh, this interdisciplinary team should involve multiple disciplines uh, like endocrinology, internal medicine, oncology, surgery, um, ENT surgeon, but also a surgeon uh, for uh, abdominal uh, PPGL, radiotherapy, radiology, nuclear medicine, clinical and molecular genetics, uh, clinical chemistry and pathology, and 
only very important because we, we need to interact um, uh, for all patient decisions. As you know, there are some clinical guidelines available. We have just now published guidelines dedicated to patients with uh, SDHD mutation. It has been published in Lancet uh, Endocrinology a few days ago, and we will send very fastly, maybe today or tomorrow, a new guidelines for SDHB patients, but there are also additional guidelines that has already been published, for example, in patients with metastatic disease. One of the complexity and challenging uh, challenge situation in patients uh, with a PPGL is that they can be widely distributed from the skull base to the pelvic floor. And grossly, we can distinguish uh, patients with head and neck pragangliomas. And these pragangliomas are mostly uh, associated with the parasympathetic nervous system. And they can be located um, in, they can arise from, for example, the jugular bulb, and they are called uh, um, jugular uh, pragangioma. They can also arise from the middle here, and they are called tympanic pragangiomas. And large jugular pragangioma can invade uh, also uh, the middle here, and they can, when they are large, often called jugular tympanic pragangliomas. They can arise from the vagus, uh, the vaga, vagus uh, nerve paraganglia, uh, and they are called vagal paraganglioma, and they can arise from the carotid body, and they are called carotid body paraganglioma. As you can see here, most of these paraganglioma uh, are near the vessels, the great vessels, but they are also, and especially for vagus nerve paraganglioma, but also skull based paraganglioma, very close cranial nerves. So the, their management is very challenging and very complex. And regarding the abdominal PPGL, they can arise from the adrenal medulla, and they are called furcomocytoma, but they can also arise from the sympathetic uh, ganglia uh, located uh, close to the abdominal aorta. And uh, most of these paraganglioma secret catecholamines and are often associated with hyper hypertension and also uh, an additional uh, symptoms. So, and in patients with uh, um, genetic mutation, for example, in SDHD, you can have both head and neck paraganglioma and abdominal paraganglioma. For SDHB, it is most, it mostly involved abdominal extra adrenal uh, ganglia, paraganglia, but it can also involve head and neck paraganglioma, but it is uh, less frequent. And as you can see, depending on the uh, situation, you will have different location for men two patient. It is, and also an F1 patient, it is almost always limited to the adrenal medulla. So there is a kind of relationship between phenotype and uh, genotype. Regarding molecular imaging or nuclear imaging, you have to know that it provides some functional information. And since it provides some functional information, it could be completely negative uh, despite the presence of a disease. For example, if you want to locate uh, a, a membrane receptor uh, with a radiopharmaceutical, and there is no membrane receptor in a specific tumor, you will not see anything despite the presence of the disease. So this nuclear imaging provides and is tightly linked to uh, functionality, not functionality in terms of secretion, but 
in terms of expression of various targets, molecular targets. It is also called molecular imaging. One of the main advantages, advantages, advantage, sorry, of this molecular imaging relied, relies on the specificity of uh, the uh, results. Uh, because we have now some very specific radiopharmaceutical and there are very few, but not impossible, but few uh, differential diagnoses. So we know, and we know perfectly what kind of potential false positive uh, result we could have. So for a nuclear physician, usually it's easy to distinguish a true positive from a false positive finding. So the specificity is very important and much more important than morphological imaging. Regarding the disadvantages, is that the uptake is variable uh, across across disease subtype and when you know the underlying genetic background it is easier to choose what would be the best radiopharmaceutical it is also costly and it uses ionizing uh, radiations unlike for example mri But you have to know that it is usually important to combine both molecular imaging and functional imaging. This is an example of, uh, for example, a jugular parganglioma. As you can see, it arises from the jugular bulb, very close to the cranial nerves and very close, close to the temporal bone. And if you want to have a very good information uh, regarding the paraganglioma and its extension, most of the time you have to combine functional imaging, MRI, but also temporal bone uh, CT scan. And with all of the information will, you will provide, you will be very complete in terms of exhaustivity um, regarding the, the, the number of lesions and the extension of the, the disease. So the role of uh, functional imaging, also called nuclear imaging or molecular imaging, is to confirm the diagnosis in doubtful situation, to enable early detection of PPGL in hereditary cases, that may facilitate curative treatment and provide appropriate follow-up. It can detect multifocality and metastasis, and this could influence therapeutic decisions, and it can select patients for radiotherapeutics. So somatostatin receptor PET imaging, why? First of all, you have to know that regardless of uh, the radiopharmaceutical, regardless of the isotope, gallium or copper, um, most all of this radiopharmaceutical will bind uh, to somatostatin receptor, which are located at the surface, at the surface of the tumors. And if the ligand is a somatostatin agonist, you will have an internalization uh, of the ligand into the cell and uh, with a retention of the radiopharmaceutical in the tumors. If this is an antagonist, it will stay at the surface. Regarding the, the imaging, you will not have a big difference, but it could have a very important difference uh, for uh, therapeutic approaches. Uh, more of 80% of PPGL overexpress somatostatin receptor. Um, and this is for all kind of genotype. And a finding which is very important is that patient with SDH mutation, regardless of the subunit, uh, overexpress uh, somatostatin receptor in uh, 
a very large amount of patients and tumors. The uptake is not linked to catecholamine secretion, so you will have a very strong binding and uptake for head and neck pregangioma, for example. There are, and this is inherent and linked to the physical resolution of the techniques, there is some minimal size for detection. It is not a clear cut size, but it's around five millimeters. So it is never impossible to have a very small, a very teeny uh, millimeter uh, pragenglioma, mostly, for example, in the head and neck, positive for angio CT and not uh, by PET imaging. This is not very frequent, but it is not, this is not impossible. And this can occur, for example, in patients with SDHD that could have very, very, very small uh, head and neck paraganglioma. And there is no clear difference in terms of sensitivity between gallium or copper labeled somatostatin analogs. This is um, head to head comparison from this image from come from the NIH uh, uh, of different uh, imaging, functional imaging modality in a patient with metastatic disease. Uh, and on the left side, this is um, somatostatin analog label with gallium followed by FDG and dopapet and MIBG. And as you can see here, there is a very strong uptake with uh, somatostatin analogs, somatostatin receptor PET, and also FDG, but quasi no uptake with topopet and no uptake with MIBG. And this is a clear and a typical feature that can be observed in patients with SDHB uh, or SDHA and uh, metastatic. Uh, disease. And this is a clear uh, relationship between the uptake and genotype. And this has also been shown by the NIH for sporadic cases that somatostatin receptor PET imaging should be the first imaging modality in patients with metastatic disease. And for example, in this case, uh, you can you can also that the patient could not be eligible for MIBG therapy with, for example, classical low dose, uh, low activity, or or also high activity MIBG because there is no uptake on MIBG scan. So remember, for metastatic disease, regardless of the genotype, somatostatin receptor PET imaging is the best imaging modality. For head and neck paraganglioma, most of the case, um, they will be strongly positive uh, for uh, somatostatin receptor PET, on somatostatin receptor PET imaging. This is a large, uh, here, jugular paraganglioma with an extension uh, into the internal vein. And when we perform uh, a head-to-head -head comparison between somatostatin receptor PET imaging called SSA here in this slide, and DOPAPET, which was in the past the best imaging modality. As you can see here, the uptake is much more important, and this will facilitate the detection of all very small paraganglioma. And as you can see here, and this is clearly shown by the arrow, you can see there is a very small um, uh, um, vagus nerve left pregangioma that with a very faint uptake on the puppet imaging. And you can miss this kind of paraganglioma with the uh, puppet imaging. And we did not have any information regarding this in the past. But now when we compare both radiopharmaceutical Somatostatin receptor PET is the best imaging modality for head and neck pregangliomas. This is uh, another example that 
in a patient with SDHD with three different paraganglioma. And as you can see here, there is, with the short arrow, there is a large, and this is not very usual, but there is a large left paraganglioma that was completely missed by Doppet imaging. And this clearly illustrates that, you know, the uptake is, can be determined by the genotype. Regarding cleochromocytoma and abdominal uh, sympathetic paraganglioma's, I have to say that we have less experience and less data, less published data. Uh, this is three different examples from uh, our centers that show a comparable uptake in three different cases with cleochromocytoma. But it has been published uh, that the sensitivity can be decreased uh, in abdominal forms. So I have to say that we need additional information for especially sporadic patient with ferrochromocytoma. And I have few cases uh, not already published that showed better result with dopopet. So we have to investigate more uh, this, um, this location in the specific case of sporadic abdominal paraganglioma, and we need some additional published data. Regarding VHL, it is clear that somatostatin receptor PET is not the best radiopharmaceutical. Here we have a very rare case of VHL disease uh, in a patient with metastatic disease. And as you can see here on DOPPET imaging, we, we will find two different uh, distant metastases uh, marked by an arrow. And you can, ha we have also a small left pheochromocytoma. This is a red cycle. And as you can see on somatostatin receptor PET imaging, the uptake in the lung was very faint was in object in the lung, and the small left paraganglioma was missed due to the uptake by the normal adrenal gland, because with somatostatin receptor PET imaging, the normal adrenal will be positive. FDG was suboptimal, but finds higher results than somatostatin receptor PET imaging, and MIBG could be interesting, but due to the lower resolution of the technique you will be you will miss some very small lesions regarding nf1 patient there are no clear results in the literature but i have to say that dopapet is a very good radiopharmaceutical for this patient and this patient most most of the time have adrenal uh, have chromocytoma and dopapet should be I think the best radiopharmaceutical, and it has been written as this in the guidelines. When somatostatin receptor PET imaging performed at initial diagnosis, and especially in patients with SDH mutation, extra adrenal PPGL, or metastatic disease, I think it, it is clear that we need to have a multimodality imaging, including somatostatin receptor PET imaging. In the follow-up, when the patient has been treated and, for example, operated, the use of somatostatin receptor PET imaging should be determined on an individual basis uh, uh, if, the, um, the, if this modality has been performed before the treatment. But it could be recommended uh, if um, there, we have no any information regarding somatostatin receptor PET imaging, and it has not been performed before uh, surgery. And this is most likely for extra adrenal uh, or uh, SDH related PPGL. Regarding the evaluation of disease progression in metastatic PPGL, this could be recommended, recommended 
but um, the, the frequency uh, to perform this imaging should be determined on an individual basis in the setting of a multidisciplinary um, meeting with experts. For therapy, as you know, if you want to select patients who are, who are likely to benefit from either MIBG, but also PART with somatostatin analogs labeled with lutetium, we need to perform somatostatin receptor PET and MIBG scan. It is important and it is needed, needed for patient eligibility for this kind of radiotherapeutic approaches. Uh, regarding PRT, the principle is the same. Uh, the ligand could be the same, and uh, but the isotope is different. Here it's the lutetium, and when you will have an uptake into the tumor, the lutetium will uh, destroy the cell. Uh, but usually, and we need to perform different cycle therapeutic cycles uh, to have and um, to achieve good results and you have to know that with lutetium dotatate most of the patient will experience disease stabilization following the treatment uh, regarding mibg versus prt it depends on the imaging phenotype if you perform both mibg scan but also uh, somatostatin receptor PET imaging, you will choose, if possible and if available, the radiopharmaceutical, the therapeutic radiopharmaceutical that will have uh, a higher uh, tumor uptake on eligibility imaging. And if you have positivity for both imaging uh, studies, you will choose PRT, for example, in patients with a lower bone marrow reserve. So uh, to conclude, I would like to say that somatostatin receptor PET imaging is currently the best imaging modality uh, for PPGL patients, uh, and especially for patients with head and neck paraganglion metastatic disease or patients with SDH mutation. Somatostatin receptor PET imaging can guide management that need to be always discussed in an expert interdisciplinary endocrine tumor board to ensure favorable outcomes. And somatostatin receptor PET imaging can select patients who are likely to benefit from PRT. I would like to thank you for your attention and to thank my colleagues and especially the Professor Karel Pachak from the NIH. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. We have um, some questions now that I will uh, pull up here. Okay, let's see. Our first question is, is CU64 dotatate imaging as sensitive as C, uh, sorry, GA, at 68. Is there a reason to consider one over the other? Thanks. No, there is currently there is no any data that that provide more evidence to use one or another one. So the best would be just to have a somatostatin receptor PET imaging regardless of the isotope used. Very good. Thank you. Um, Okay, our second question is, uh, with SDHB genetic mutation, should this procedure be conducted periodically? Oh, so this is a very good question. Uh, periodically, um, it has to be determined, uh, I think, really on an individual basis. Um, and it, it depends. It depends on the size of the lesions. It depends on probably additional uh, information, such as information from pathology. Is there any proliferation? Is there any mitosis? 
It depends also on the locations of the tumors. It depends on the need or not to select patients for PRT. So it is really a complex decision to, to try to determine what is the best time interval between various um, uh, somatostatin receptor PET imaging. I would say probably from one year to from six months to three years, it depends, uh, it should be determined on an, an individual basis. So there is no rule in this situation. Great, thank you. Okay, um, what are consensus guidelines for imaging requirements post paraganglioma pheochromocytoma excision? Oh, sorry, I did not understand. Could you please repeat? Okay, sure. No problem. Um, what are the consensus guidelines for imaging requirements at, basically after you have a paraganglioma or pheochromocytoma removed? Ah, okay. So it depends. It, it, it depends. If uh, it depends on the underlying genetic stages. For example, if you have been operated for a spor sporadic pheochromocytoma, and there is no any pejorative information, uh, any pejorative features on pathological examination, and the tumor is not very large, and the tumor has been removed, and uh, biochemical and clinical um, uh, data are completely normal, I think that we do not need to perform additional uh, somatostatin receptor PET imaging. By contrast, if you have a very large uh, SDHB-related uh, paraganglioma, even if it has been completely cured by surgery, you will need to perform additional imaging study during the follow-up because you will try to identify any recurrence that could be observed in the tumor beds, but also new PPGL, but also potential metastasis. So it is clearly dependent on the size, size of the tumor, on pathological information, but also on the gen genotype. So again, for sporadic small pheochromocytoma, there is no need to perform any somatostatin receptor PET imaging or any additional functional imaging during the follow-up. Great, thank you. Okay, let's see. Oh, this is kind of a, a similar question. This is how often should I have a PET scan? Oh, uh, how often? Yeah, this is, this is uh, close to the uh, previous question. I, I think if every patient should be evaluated by somatostatin receptor PET imaging before initiating any treatment, I think that is really important, very important, especially, for example, for patients with head and neck paraganglioma, it is very important to know how many lesions you will have. Is it only paraganglioma on a single side? It is on both sides. It is dependent. It is vagus nerve, paraganglioma, carotid body, because re depending on each individual situation, you will, you will have a, a very important impact on the management of patients. So I would suggest first, and this will be a very important, uh, very important uh, key, uh, uh, key point, is to, to be evaluated by somatostatin receptor PET imaging. If you have an extra adrenal paraganglioma, a metastatic disease, or a mutation in one of the SDH subunits. This is crucial for the management. And following the treatment, it depends on many, many factors. So how often, I would say it depends, maybe never if you have been operated for a sporadic case. If you have not been operated and you just want to follow, for example, a small 
head and neck pragangioma. I think that morphological imaging, for example, with MRI could be sufficient uh, just to see when you have located all of the small pragangioma by somatostatin receptor PET imaging at diagnosis. And for example, you don't want to have any aggressive management because there are only small pregangioma and all of the lesions can be seen by MRI. For example, in the context of SDHD mutation, I think that you can follow the patient with MRI. I'm not sure that it is clearly necessary to have very frequent somatostatin receptor PET imaging. Maybe it could be at three years, for example, but all of these decisions should be discussed on an individual basis. So I would say it is dependent on the genotype also. And uh, But the most important point is to be evaluated before any uh, therapeutic management. It is very important. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. OK, uh, let's see. Can a dotatate PET scan identify metastasis in the liver? What is the best image modality for the diagnosis? For, for the liver, yes. Uh, yes, there is no, it, de it depends on the genotype, but uh, usually you can detect metastasis regardless of the location. It is true that you will have a background due to the uh, uptake by the normal, the LC liver, but the uptake usually in PPGL is so important compared to the uh, background uptake that you will be able to depict all of the small uh, metastases. So I think that, yeah, there is no specific difficulty or problems or false negative findings specifically in the liver if the receptor are present you will find them and this is regardless of the location and there is no specific problem regarding the uptake by the normal liver due to the very high tumor to background uptake ratio great great awesome um okay let's see um what type of scan should be done for very small paraganglioma in the biliary system? Oh, so this is a very rare. I have never seen personally uh, such location. Uh, so I think that we have no clear ID because uh, I have not. I'm, I am not aware of large. Uh, Case report or case report series that specifically provide information in this specific location. So it's never easy to respond. But I would say that I will. I would start. Uh, I would start personally with somatostatin receptor PET imaging because with DopoPET you will have some uh, problem due to the physiological. Uh, physiological clearance of the radiopharmaceutical by the biliary system. So I think that I will start, I would start with uh, somatostatin receptor PET imaging, but I'm not sure that in this specific location this would be the best radiopharmaceutical. Personally, I have never seen such location. And uh, I am not aware of uh, very large data or case series that could provide a very uh, uh, firm uh, recommendation regarding this uh, location. So I will start probably by somatostatin receptor PET imaging, maybe followed by my BG scan. Uh, I don't know, and perhaps uh, DopoPET, but with DopoPET, we would need to to make a preparation due to the, yes, due to the excretion, but this is not easy with the puppet. This will not be easy with the, uh, yes, with the puppet due to the physiological clearance of the radiopharmaceutical, uh, uh, yes. Oh, this sounds like a very rare condition. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Uh, do non-secreting tumors always show up in scans?
When they are in the lungs, is there a certain scan that works better than others? Please, I did not, I did not understand. Please. Uh, no problem. Uh, okay. Um, do non-secreting tumors always show up in scans? Um, when they are in the lungs, is there a certain scan that works better than others? Ah, okay. And they are no, not secreting, right? Not secreting, right? right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, regarding the um, uh, the lung uptake, uh, there as for the liver, there is no clear relationship between the um, the, the, the anatomical uh, location and the uptake with either uh, somatostatin receptor PET imaging FDG or or a dope pet. Uh, it most dependent, it is most likely dependent on the genotype. Um, yes, if you are, for example, a patient with SDHB, uh, you will be suboptimal with dope pet imaging and you will miss uh, this kind of lesion. So I would say that for patients with metastatic disease, Somatostatin receptor PET imaging is the best radiopharmaceutical. But as I shown you previously, for patients with VHL, for example, sometimes, but it is very few cases, maybe less than 5% of VHL patients have metastatic disease. And here for this patient, you, you will miss the lung metastasis with somatostatin receptor PET imaging. So it is always um, linked between genotype if you have no information regarding the genetic background start with somatostatin receptor pet imaging if you have the information um, for example if it uh, sporadic head and neck if if you have a sporadic head and neck metastatic head and neck paragangioma dupapet is a very good radiopharmaceutical also and if somatostatin receptor pet imaging is not available, you could perform dopapet imaging in this context. But if you have a metastatic uh, abdominal uh, PPGL linked to SDH mutation, you will miss uh, metastasis, metastasis uh, regardless of the anatomical uh, location. So to respond clearly, there is no relationship between the anatomical location and the sensitivity to to somatostatin receptor PET and the pet imaging. This is most likely dependent on the location of the primary tumors and dependence on the underlying genotype. Sounds like genetics is really important to, to know which way to go on these things. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Oh, one of our uh, questions is, um, the patient has a 20-month-year-old uh, son. What are the safety precautions with proximity and isolation, and for how long? Uh, regarding the adults, there is no any safety. Just to not be too close during the, the few hours uh, following uh, the injection of radiopharmaceuticals. So it is really quasi no safety concern regarding diagnosis uh, nuclear imaging modalities. Great. And what about uh, breastfeeding? Yeah, usually we recommend to not um, continue breastfeeding feeding the day uh, of the imaging. So, by contrast, we can restart the breastfeeding uh, 24 hours following the imaging. Oh, great. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, let's see. Oh, I think we actually, I think you answered this question already, but um, can the tumor be not detected in the scan when it is not secreting? And it sounds like the, the, it does identify non-secreting tumors. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. this is not linked, especially for somatostatin receptor PET imaging. There is no link, clear link 
with linked with a secretion and you can perform this kind of modality regardless of the secretion uh, patterns okay great great um okay let's see is it possible that there are pheos and paras that give symptoms but cannot be detected by current scans for example have they not yet discovered receptors yeah yes but if you combine sometime we have patients with some symptoms they could be unusual symptoms uh and sometimes we performed all of the image. Usually, the the biology is normal or quasi normal, and uh, all of the imaging modalities are negative. Um, but we need to perform all of the different imaging modalities because the symptoms can be very important for patient. It is important to to be sure and to rule out uh, any PGL. But we have some cases uh, with symptoms um, and there is no evidence of PPGL on any imaging studies. Usually when we follow the patient, we, we will not find any PPGL during the follow-up. So I think that with the current very high sensitive imaging modalities and when we combine different imaging modalities for example combination or morphological imaging for like ct scan for example for thoracic and abdominal pelvic paragangliomas and uh, mri for head and neck paragangliomas somatostatin receptor pet imaging for whole body scan but also dopapet imaging and all are clearly negative with only borderline or negative uh, metanephrines, usually uh, we do not find any PPGL during the follow-up. But we have to perform all of the imaging modalities. Um, most important also, there are some... Uh, we, we have to, to be very... Uh, to screen all the PPGL, regardless of the location, and there are some locations that can be missed uh, if we do not try to clearly identify those paraganglioma, especially, for example, um, in the pelvic floor. Sometimes you can find uh, in the bladder, urinary bladder, you can find some paraganglioma. And um, because all of the radiopharmaceuticals have a urinary clearance, and if you do not pay attention regarding the specific location, you can miss you can miss some pelvic uh, paragangioma. So um, I would say that if patients are symptomatic, uh, we have to perform all of the imaging modality to be sure that there is no evidence of PPGL and to be attentive on unusual location. But if it is negative, usually during follow-up, you will not find uh, PPGL. Okay, oh, very interesting. Okay, let's see. Um, what is the minimal size of a tumor which can be detected by GA68 dotatate scan? Are you there, Dr. Taib? Uh oh. I think, let's see. I think we might have lost Dr. Taib. Let's, um, this is Amy from the Fio Para Alliance. Okay. Karen, <laughs> thanks. It's, um, I think we might have lost him. Let's give him a few minutes to uh, see if he makes it back on and um, can finish up with the questions. Uh, to people who have joined us, sorry about the link mix up on the Facebook page today. Um, 
if you did register, the correct link, of course, was included in your register uh, registration information. Um, but we think we've gotten the correct link posted back out on social media. And I apologize. That was completely my mistake. And um, I'm very sorry for the mix up this morning. Um, so I hope that uh, Dr. Taib will be joining us. We're doing our best to work through your questions. I think we've gotten some really good information from him so far. Um, how are you feeling about things, Karen? Are you still there? Oh, this okay. is fantastic. No, I'm just, um, oh, so much of it actually is applicable to my current situation. So it's been very helpful for me and I feel a lot more uh, informed and uh, I think it's gonna be awesome. And it, it just sounds like it's just so critical that uh, this test is done for people with the SDHD and other, you know, no mutations. And it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating to me because there's doctors here that I have in town that, uh, you know, didn't, wouldn't have, um, you know, wouldn't let have the test done. And it just sounds like it's, it seems like it's a no brainer that you should have it done if you have the mutation. So I think this is excellent to have these sessions and, and get to the medical community so that the doctors know to um, the protocol for treating people with these genetic mutations. Yes, that's a really good point. And um, it's a good reminder that we do have the clinical care guidelines on our website. And as Dr. Tayyib mentioned, some clinical care guidelines will be updated actually imminently in the next few days. Um, we try to post those as soon as they're publicly available so that you can download those resources and take them to your doctor. Also, they're useful if you are experiencing some issues with insurance coverage of your um, uh, procedures. And it looks like Dr. Taib's back, so I'm gonna be quiet and let him talk some more. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry <laughs> I have a, a technical problem. <laughs> no, no problem, no problem. Okay, I, uh, let's see, I think we left off on um, oh, yes. What is the minimal size of a tumor which can be detected by a GA68 dotatate scan? So I have previously said there are some physical limitations regarding the, the camera and also PET CT camera. So I would say five millimeters, but this is not a clear cut, but it is around five millimeters. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, excellent. Um, let's see. Our next one is, uh, do we know what is the percentage of theoparas with somo, uh, sorry, somostatin receptors? More than, more than 80%. Oh, great. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, let's see. If you have light up in your spine, should you get an MRI or the PET scan? Uh, yeah, uh, in the spine, I, I think um, I think somatostatin receptor PET imaging has a higher sensitivity than MRI, but MRI is also useful. Um, I would say that both are complementary, but I'm, uh, I can I have many patients with many distant metastases in the spine. And somatostatin receptor PET imaging provides much more, but this is also the case for dupa PET imaging in sporadic cases show additional bone metastasis uh, that MRI. MRI is, is a very sensitive method, but it is suboptimal compared to somato. So if, if you want to rule out or to depict all of the uh, uh, all the uh, spines uh, metastasis, uh, PET imaging will perform better that MR than MRI. Okay, great. Well, it looks like we're out of time. So thank you so much, Dr. Tayyip. We really appreciate your uh, your help with everything. And um, I will, uh, let's see, we, we thank you for your time and dedication to our patient community. Um, this webinar will be available in a few days on YouTube and, uh, and on the website. And we will also transcribe the question and answer portion and we'll have that available as well. Please sign up for our e-news and uh, follow us on social media. If this information has been useful to you and, and you are interested in donating, you can do so at 
www.ghostbusters.org slash donate. Uh, special thanks to Progenics again for making this webinar series possible through an educational grant. And thank you so much, Dr. Tayyib, and thank you for everyone for attending today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.